Hi, um, I'm Linda Lawrence. I'm an instructional assistant at um, Andover High School. I've been there in this job for um, 20 years and um, we're presenting today as a team because I've worked with Helen and Steph for a very long time and we do collaborate on a weekly if not more often basis. Um, so we just wanted to give you an overview of working with other people and using your team approach. Mm -hmm. I'm Helen Fitzgerald. I'm a speech language pathologist also at Andover High School. Been doing this for about 25 years now. And I've worked across all the different settings. But part of the reason, like Linda said, we really want to do this is because um, we think it is so important to take a team approach and um, that you guys are just so important part of the team. So that's kind of why we're here. Steph? I'm Stephanie Hand. I've also taught for over 20 years. I've been at Andover High School for 18 of them. Um, I teach small, substantially separate classes in uh, biology and physical science. And I have worked with IAs since I started teaching. And in more than one case, they have say, literally saved my life. So um, again, I, I Helen and, and Linda both said it really well. We work as a team and we succeed as a team. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, before we start, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're really happy that you're here uh, to learn more about things that the three of us are really passionate about. Um, but since this is online and not, you know, not in a, a, a real, uh, setting. We just wanted to go over um, the online learning, um, basically agreements. Um, please mute your microphones unless you're speaking because um, we will hear everything that's going on. Little kids, <laughs> bathrooms, uh, teapots going off, so thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Does everybody know how to mute and then unmute? because we are gonna uh, have participation and you are gonna be talking. Great. Um, also, please uh, keep your video camera on because we're trying to make this interactive. We really do wanna see you so that we can all engage. Um, we also understand that there's sometimes when people can't and- And that's know, okay. But, yeah, that's if okay. If you can though, if you can, yeah. we'd like you to- um, the same thing with using cell phones and other activities. If you have to go answer a call, that's fine. Just make sure you're muted so we don't hear all the details. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, the other thing is, if you normally are a talker the way the three of us are, um, please step back a little bit. If you're normally quiet, please step up when it's time for us to, when it's time for everyone to participate. Um, so that's, um, is everybody right now seeing these, the um, PowerPoint okay? Um, okay, if you have questions, uh, please put your chat function on um, and you can raise, you can also use the raise your hand function. We're gonna go over that in a minute if you're not familiar with it. Um, we're gonna, we are gonna have a 10 minute break about halfway through the presentation because sitting for two hours is a long time to sit. And some of our kids have to sit that long. And again, it's not fair to them, it's not fair to you. Um, and once again, we really do appreciate the interaction at, at, at the appropriate times. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, we put in a Zoom review here just for the, the really important um, functions that we're gonna use. So um, raising your hand at the very bottom toolbar, if you go down there, you'll see, um, you'll see your, you should find your name on the sidebar, click more, and then there, the, once after you've clicked more, there's a raise hand icon. Just click on that. So um, can you all do that so we know? So go to participants. Okay. 
Amy. And find your name. Oh, right. Three people, four people. But Excellent. We're getting there. Okay. So participants, find your name, more, and then you should see raise your hand. Okay. <clears throat> We're getting there. And if there's a Q&A section, um, I could definitely call on the hands that are being raised for you. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you. Everyone comfortable with this? Ah, lovely. Kathleen, you got it. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. And then, um, okay. For, Joanne. Let's see. There's a chat box, which we'd also like you to use uh, for questions, for comments. If there's anything that um, you put in there, we will be all looking at it. We might not get to it immediately, but we will be. We, we will try really hard to answer all questions that you post in there. Um, so to get to the chat box again, it's the more button on the toolbar, click chat, and then there's a sidebar that comes in. Um, after, the only thing I'm gonna say is after you've typed it in, please hit enter. That's one thing I forget to do half the time and I actually consciously have to think of it. So, um, okay, then there's a yes, no button, um, and that's in participants, like raising your hand, and then you can either click yes or no. Um, you can ask us to go slower, to go faster. Um, there's also, mm -hmm. you know, other like, dislike, clapping. If you need a break, put that in as well. Um, we all try and, and make our students advocate for themselves when they need something from us. So please feel free to do that too. And then we are gonna be going into the break rooms. If you need help when you're in your break room, um, please click more and then there's an ask for help icon. Okay. We, um, we wrote this workshop with two things in mind. Um, we have a number of behavior management strategies for you to use. Some of you may be using some of them already, but our goal is for you to be able to talk about four or five different strategies and the ones that you find useful, I, we hope you'll be able to implement them after the workshop. The other piece of the workshop is looking at strategies to collaborate effectively with not only teachers, but other team members. Um, so that's the second piece of the workshop. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about um, is knowing your students and um, hoping that everyone has access to the IEPs. Um, and if you don't have access to the IEP, do you know a route to find access to the IEP? Um, I think we're, we're a small enough group right now that if anyone wants to respond to that, like they can. Do you all have access to IEPs at this point? Um, feel free to unmute yourself, nod, whatever. You wanna add anything to this? I have so access do. to my students' IEPs um, through the teacher in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same here. That's yeah. usually who I go to. Yeah, I don't have access to um, you know, online or anything, but the teacher. Um, okay. And it's the full. It's the full IEP, not the easy one. I look at the full one. The full okay. one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, that's wonderful. So as long as everyone knows a way, either through the special ed office or through your teacher, yeah. to view those IEPs, I think that's pretty awesome. Sorry, Linda. Go ahead. Oh no. Um, so an active role in the classroom, and that's going to look very different depending on um, what grade you're in um, and what's, what kind of program you're in. I'm in inclusion classes for math and science. Um, so for me, my active role in the classroom is to be up and walking and checking in um, on all the students, seeing where there's difficulties. Um, you may be a one-on-one. -on -one with someone that needs you constantly. So that's going to be a different thing. Um, the way I look at my role is my job is to work myself out of a job. My job is to get my students to
to be independent enough to not need me. And that's the long-term goal. Um, building trust is really critical, uh, especially with our, with our kids. And again, depending on what grade level you're at, that's gonna look very differently. Um, for me at high school, it's being interested in what they're doing outside of school, um, just really getting to know them as a person, um, establishing some boundaries. And um, a big thing for me is to let them know that I screw up too. Mm -hmm. So something I do, which kids think is funny, is I have a role for every class and when they catch me in a mistake, I write their name down in the date and when they have five, they get a Dunkin' Donuts card. So that kind of builds a little rapport automatically because it's like, ah, we can catch her. Um, using student strengths. Uh, I know we look at the IEPs and we see deficit, 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 and part of getting to know them is to find their strengths and help them really understand that they have strengths because so many of our kids don't. They just see the deficits and helping them understand their strengths and how to use those is really critical. So in the IEP, there are a few places where you might find information um, about behavior, but we also don't want the IEP to be the first impression you get of the students or the only um, impression. Um, what, how a student looks on paper is often very, very different to how they present in class. And it may even be different from class to class or from teacher to teacher. Um, the first place is the parental concerns because very often students' behavior is foremost in the minds of their parents um, and can be a, a, a real um, disadvantage in getting what they need. Another place is what goals have been established for the students. There are some students who have behavioral goals in, in writing. Um, there are also some students who have behavior plans, and these are things that you also should have access to. Um, another place is the area called FLEP A and FLEP B, which stands for Present Levels of Educational Performance. Um, that's where the accommodations are listed, and accommodations can also give you clues to um, what type of um, behaviors the students may present and that you should be on the lookout for. Um, so again, this is, but really um, your own instincts and the personal interaction with the students are going to eventually guide you to what they need to make sure the behavior is compatible with the classroom. Can I ask a quick question for those of you who do work with, um, well, I, I'm assuming it's all of you. Do you read the IEP before you meet the student, meet the student or after? So in the past, I've read it after. Okay. Uh, Have you I get to know them first? Okay. How about you, Carissa? What were you going to say? Oh, I like to read it after. I like to meet them and then read it. Okay. Have any of you had this experience then? I have had kids come up and I read the IEP and then I meet the person and they're completely different. Like they're nothing like what it says they're supposed to be in this IEP. And I'm like, wait a minute. Who is who, who is this kid that you're talking about? Yeah. And unfortunately, it's often they come up with a much more negative bent. Going to be a troublemaker, is going to be angry, is going to be this and that. And then you meet this like sweet and charming young man. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very interesting the, what type of picture can be created through an IEP. And you know, often it's necessary, especially if they've gone through some sort of you know, phase. But... Um, I think parents are very grateful when we look at who their student is first before we look at the paper. We've had some parents who have said to us, yeah, we don't understand why they keep putting these things in, in the IEP. And they say, thank you for telling us that you see someone different. So 
really trust your instincts here. Like, because we know, right? Like we know you beat someone, you just, you know. All right. Steph, anything else for this one? Um, actually, yeah, Donna brought up something that is important in transition years from elementary to uh, middle and from middle to high school. Kids change. They change so much and they change <laughs> from year to year. So I think that was a really important observation that, that uh, Donna yeah. made. Donna, do you work in middle or high school? I'm in middle school. Okay, so you see what happens. They can be all crazed and coming up yes. from fifth grade. <laughs> and we go, this isn't the same kid. How could they write all this? And then, yeah, I'm sure the high school feels the same way we do too, Absol but absolutely, it would be nice to get some, some maybe common language to share that's right. more fitting to the student. Yeah, right. I agree. I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how we do that. But I think well, that that would be either. very important. The other thing is IEPs are written at all times of the year. So if you write right. an IEP in October, by the following September, there's been a year of growth. If you write an IEP in mm. June, right. there still can be a lot of change over the summer. But again, it's a, there's a time lag in all of this. Yeah. Yep. So true. All right. So. Um, we're going to start talking about some behavior management techniques now and a lot of the information I think is stuff you probably know. I'm hoping that it will be validating for you. Um, it's just we want to bring this back into your forefront. A lot of the behavior management strategies we're talking about can be actually preemptive, which is really what we want. We would prefer to see um, that we don't have that behavior at all. Right. And you guys are on the front line of this. So once again, knowing your student, like Linda said, is really key. Uh, so a lot of the information is out there, right? Like there's a ton of information about evidence based strategies that work for behavior management. I took a lot of this information from this man, Tom McIntyre. He worked uh, at Hunter College uh, because I like how he breaks things down into very discrete pieces. So it's one thing to say, you know, like be positive. It's another thing to actually have some language to use. So if you want to look him up, he's pretty awesome, uh, Tom McIntyre. Um, but he really kind of frames where we're going to be going through the behavior management piece. Before we get to that, I want to talk about Carl Rogers, the psychologist. Years ago, the one of his concepts really kind of framed how I do things now. It's called unconditional positive regard. Are you all familiar with this? So unfamiliar positive regard says that no matter what you do or what you've done, I kind of, I respect you as a human being. I may not like what you've done, but in general, I see you as a human being and I respect you because of that. So everything I do is kind of couched in that because a lot of our students often feel very judged. They feel like they're not as worthwhile as other people. They're often defined by their weaknesses. Um, but when they know that you just see them as a human being and you accept them for who they are, and this goes across all ages, by the way, kids know when we're sincere and when mm -hmm. we respect them and when they don't. Uh, they're much more willing to, to accept your assistance and they're much more willing to do what you ask of them if they see that no matter, no matter what, like you're a human being and I'm going to respect you for that reason. So how you communicate with your students will directly impact how they behave and what they'll do for you. So the phrasing techniques that we're going to talk about are respectful, they're positive. They're also very simple and effective, which is what you really need, right? Like when you're in the classroom with a kid and he's having a hard time, you can't be like, oh, let me look through this eight page manual. Oh, hold on, stop doing that thing you're doing and let me just check this out. Uh, oh, which one, if this, then that. So we don't, you know, what we look for are things that are just simple and effective. The other thing is the, the ones that we've chosen are psychoeducational, which means that they're going to promote the development of positive personal relationships. They're going to help the students change their own thoughts 
and they involve the students in changing and being aware of their own behaviors. So, um, you know, that seems like quite a lot when you look at the evidence. And then when you see the strategies, you're going to be like, oh, I do that. Like, oh, really? That? That's what you mean by this psychoeducational, respective, respectful, positive thing? Um, but you need to know that there's a lot of power and a lot of research behind the things that you can say and do. So here are the things we don't want, right? And I thought we'd start with that because these types of student, these types of um, statements blame the students. So not only do they not make things better, they actually make things worse. So when, when we ask why questions, they, they seem like they're looking for information, right? Like they're seeking information, but really what they're saying is I caught you being bad and now I'm going to make you squirm first before I punish you, you know, like, um, this, this, why did you do that? You know, I'm waiting for an answer. Why did you lick Johnny? Like, why would you do such a thing? Right? Like we know the answer. We kind of know, right? So asking them just makes them feel kind of squirmy. Um, it puts kids in an uncomfortable situation and it often, they, they often end up lying because like they want to avoid this uncomfortable situation. So, <laughs> You know, they're going to be like, they're going to be fresh to you. They're going to avoid or escape. Those are the things they're going to do. And we are like, why did you do that? So we don't want that. Uh, you statements kind of attack and hurt. You did this. You did that. Um, they're controlling and they're confrontational. You need to do this right now. So we want to try to avoid that. Again, if we think in terms of preemptive right, or preventative, rather than kind of after the fact, these are the kind of things that will get you into having to now use other behavioral techniques. So we don't want the, the you questions. And no, don't set up negative confrontations. I think it took me years to learn this one. As soon as you set up that confrontation, and by saying no, don't, you're allowing your student now to be like, oh, yes, I am. So we don't really want that to happen. And the way to do that is don't say no, don't, no, don't. Instead, we're going to be talking to them about what they should be doing, not what they shouldn't be doing. And then lecturing, right? It's ineffective, it's hurtful, and it's condescending. And kids usually ignore this or rebel, right? So you start talking. And I've worked with teachers who do this, and I've worked with assistants who do this. And when they do it to me, my eyes start to glaze over. I start hearing blah, 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 blah. Yep, there they go again, yeah, blah, blah, blah. So we, so we want to avoid the lecture. In fact, most of the time, the kids aren't hearing the words anyway. So I think that all of these four types of behavior management techniques make us feel better, but they don't really support our students. All right, and so I what can honestly <laughs> say I wish I had known this when my kids were little. Ah, uh, me yeah. too, Steph. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be lovely? That would have saved a lot of hurricanes in my house. Um, okay, so what do we do instead? We're going to talk about I statements. So when we use I statements, there are three components that we want to make sure are in there. What do we want to see happen? how I feel about this and what I need. So this helps our students to understand what they want from them. Now, remember, you're going to be working with a lot of students across different ages who really don't know what's expected of them. <clears throat> so younger students may not know, students with ADD may not know, students with autism may not know. Um, lots and lots of students, they don't know. Students with um, intellectual disabilities may not know. So the world can be very confusing when you and tell also, them there are different styles between teachers where one teacher may want to see things done one way and one may not want that at all right. so, so being explicit is really important yes so kids who are confused by expectations really appreciate this direct approach what's nice about it is it's also less confrontational um, and that 
increases our chances that they will comply. Now, remember, as we go through these, none of these is like the magic pill or the magic wand. They're going to work for some kids sometimes. They're not going to work for every student every time. But in general, if you think about this framework, what do we want to see happen? What am I feeling about this? What do we need? What do I need here? That often really um, just sets the stage for kids to like say, oh, all right, I understand this now and I have some choices to make. And this, again, this works even when they're little. So when you have an I statement, you're taking away the accusations, you're taking away the defensiveness, which that you, 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 no, don't, why stuff, right? And it takes away excuses. It just is like, here it is, kind of very direct and objective. This is what we're doing. This is what I'm seeing. This is what I need you to do now. So we have, you weren't listening, right? What is that? How does that help a kid? You're not listening. If they don't understand the expectations, how does that help? They're gonna be like, yeah, all right, yeah, I stink, right? As usual, here we go, I'm the bad one. Uh, instead, you can say, I want you to listen. That's the need piece, right? So you don't miss any important information. Now you're giving them a reason to do this. At the high school level, they, may be, they still may say like, I don't care, but you're building that kind of thought process for them. And for a lot of our students, that's what they need. They need to kind of build the thought process. Why are you talking? Becomes the teacher needs it to be quiet so that everyone can hear her. So it's really, again, I, I can't stress enough. This is very effective, yet very simple. I will also say that it's not as easy to do as it looks. This is true. <laughs> um, I, I've learned a lot about this working with Helen and it does, it does take time. It does feel very artificial um, when you start, but over time you become more comfortable with it. You see that students respond better, which helped me, you know, continue with going through the discomfort. And, and now I feel, I feel comfortable doing it this way. It, it does take time. It's not, it's not a switch for us either. That's such an excellent point, Linda, because when we're talking about behavior and behavior management, we also have to think about our own and we'll be talking about that. But we know that it takes time for anyone to change any behavior, right? We have the neural pathways that are telling us to say, no, don't. Why did you do that? You should do this. So for us too, it takes time to kind of change that type of behavior. Excellent point. We got to put that in the presentation. I got to put that in the notes. Okay. Um, on the other hand, I think there are times where you will say, don't do that. Well, because it's necessary or dangerous, right? Sometimes it, yep. you can't be like, they're about to jump out the window. You can't be like, I would like you to not jump out the window. I would like you to sit in your seat. You know, if they're halfway out the window, you need to be like, no. <laughs> so great point. So we're going to go into a breakout or breakout rooms now, um, and there are five I statements. And what we'd like you to do is make these statements, which are pretty negative, into I statements. Um, we know that um, again, it, it's going to depend on the grade you're working with, um, and it's going to be different depending on that. But we'd like you to um, to change these into I statements and take the negativity out and see how you do with it. The next thing we'd like you to do is make a list of statements that you actually say to your students, um, which may fall into somewhat negative um, statements. They may be use statements or why statements, um, and then turn them into I statements. And then what, when you're in your breakout room, Pick one person to be the recorder and um, to speak for the group when we get back together. Mm -hmm. We'll be in the breakout rooms for, I think, about 15 minutes, mm -hmm. and then we'll come back as a group. Um, Steph, are you going to put that in the chat? I did. It's already in there? Okay, so if yep. you need to see the statements, oh, uh, statements oh. too. Hang on, right. Um, sorry <clears throat> just in case, because yeah. we're still working um, out the whole chat room thing. Yep. 
Yeah. You're not sure what you're going to see when you're in there. Yeah, let me get that. Probably not the statements that you need to work yeah, with. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Um, that was one thing I did not do. Let me get that out right. Let me put this right in there. Okay, so she'll put that in there. Um, All right, one, two, three, four, five, six. Two, three, four, five. One, two, okay. three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Okay, I think we're about ready. Okay. You guys. Is it in yeah. there, Steph? Yeah, it's in. The, oh, wait, no, I did it again. I didn't push. Enter. Enter. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, why is this not working? Hang on. Okay, got it. Okay, so you should all be able to see the five statements that you're going to change into I statements. In Remember, you want to say what in the chat and you want to say what it is you would like to see happen. That's really the biggest component here. Um, let's so start you. with what you came up with. Um, let's start with group one. Um, could you rephrase pay attention into something more po into an I statement that's more positive. Group one. Um, they have to unmute, right? Right. Uh -huh. You will, I hope you will pick the spokesperson for your group. If you could raise oh. your hand for whoever was in group one. Um, okay. Yeah, I you. Oh, they don't, they they don't, don't know what group they number they were in. Helen, do you have a list of the group numbers? Let me look. Okay, so breakout room one is Donna Caruso, Teresa Guzman, and Umil. Okay, this is Teresa. I actually have our redirections. Okay. Um, pay attention would be the class is paying attention now. Please, eyes on the teacher or whatever it is that they need their eyes on. Okay. Um, Stop fooling around. The class is following directions now. It's not the time to fool around. Um, um, Therese, what could they do instead of fooling around? Uh, whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing, sort of redirecting them to, you know, you need to be working on your math or you need to be reading that book right now. Well, whatever it is that they, they, they should have been doing. Mm, so, okay. All right. I gotcha. Uh, the rude comment, redirecting, whatever they should be doing, just redirect them nicely. And then sort of after the fact, do you know, rude comments very often hurt feelings and nobody likes to have their feelings hurt. Okay, uh, that's awesome. Did you write on Joey's arm? During <laughs> school, it's really not the appropriate time to be writing on other people. Okay, I love that. That's pretty and, awesome. Uh, don't ever put that in your mouth again. This happens <laughs> numerous times every day. Uh -huh. And usually it's like, you know, that's really dirty. Everybody's been touching it. You ah. can't get them in your mouth right now. Awesome. Yeah, that is fabulous. Love it. All right. So group two, we have Allison, Carissa, Kathleen, Christina, Lupe. Who would like to speak for that group? Whoever you are, you should probably. Ah, there, I have everyone again, yay. All right, so did we choose someone? Allison, Carissa, Kathleen, Christina, or Lupe? One of you gonna um, be your spokesperson? Okay, I'll choose. <laughs> I will choose Kathleen. Okay, can you hear me? Because my Wi Fi is unstable. Sounds great. Loud and clear. Loud and uh, clear. To pay attention, um, refocus, eyes on me. You know, we're all working together. Somebody mm -hmm. took notes, so. Um, but basically, just get them to refocus. Okay, I really like the idea of eyes on me as opposed to um, 
refocus. Some of the stuff that I'm, I've been hearing so far sounds kind of um, abstract. Yeah. So for a student, focus is as abstract as pay attention. Yeah. They don't know I, what that looks like, you know? I work one-on-one -on -one or with two people. So yeah. I, I basically say, what are we, what are we doing here? <laughs> you, know? you know, let's continue reading, you know? Right, yeah, great. We're, right. we're going, I need you to read now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to snack in 10 minutes. Let's finish this up before snack. Okay, excellent. So again, very explicit language. And you might have to just choose one of those as, we're, as we finish talking about these. But um, remember, these guys might be confused. So even the idea of just saying, okay, you need to focus. Yeah. Isn't, I, isn't gonna really cut it. I just lost uh, you. Can okay. you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so stop fooling around again, redirect them to whatever task you're so working what would on. You, so could you give an example of what you might say? Because that's well, really what the goal here is to have you practice using that language as opposed to saying, I'm just going to redirect. Yeah, I usually say save that energy for when we go to gym. Does anyone want to take a break? Let's all go for a walk, you know, um, because if they're losing it, let's mm -hmm. ask them what they need to do so that they can pull it back together. And they okay. usually say, let's all go for a walk, you know? Okay, so, so. some of your options there are- Yes, give them um, choices. You need to follow what the teacher is doing or you need to yeah. look at the teacher while she's speaking. Or yeah. it could be, um, I need you to take a walk with me right now so that you'll yeah. be able to pay attention when you come back. We don't- in our in my situation in the middle school we don't do whole group it's yeah. the teacher will work one-on-one -on -one or with two students so i will be yeah. working one-on-one -on -one with two students yeah. so yeah. we really don't get into that whole group situation yeah. sure. um and right. our kids basically we just say you know we got to finish this task stay with me you know or let's right. stay together and finish this up okay. so um we never have to say stop fooling around because they're pretty good. That's um, wonderful. Don't, don't make rude comments to your classroom. I mm -hmm. say we're all friends here. You know, um, remember, we, we need to use kind words with our friends. Or I right. use, a lot of us use the same word. You know, you can think things, but keep them in your think bubble. Um, Excellent. So yep, we really, that. they really don't, the only time they make a rude comment is if they're working with the head teacher. <laughs> they they, they yeah. kind of like the paras you know we're the yeah we're, we're their buddies you know we yeah. spend a lot of time it's usually when they're working one-on-one -on -one with a teacher that they'll do the f-bombs and uh yeah she yeah. and she will say did you bring your brain today you know and i just cringe but i'm like yeah. okay yeah 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 yeah, I think that um, the idea of using that very direct language of um, keep the thoughts in your head. Yeah. And then again, remember, you're, you're, the way you can help these guys to start to develop the thought processes themselves is to mm -hmm. tell them why. Yes. Right? Well, you we need to keep those say, thoughts in your head yep. so that you don't hurt Johnny's feelings. Yeah. And I usually say... So your other friends can continue doing their independent work. They're working quietly. Yeah. So right. could you be considerate of your friends' feelings? And they're very considerate of each other. So it works for them in our class. Uh, why did you write on Joey's arm? We really don't have that. If anybody does that. We do have a student that will write on the desk and, mm. you know, and I'll mm -hmm. just say, get, get a wipe, you know? And, yeah. Um, so did anyone you know, else in the group encounter that? that something um, where someone might run on someone else's arm? I don't know. They didn't really, um, I don't think so, but anybody's able to speak up, they can answer to that. In my classroom, I would just say, you know, we don't write on our friends or please don't write on my friend. I right. need you to go get a baby wipe and let's help Joey yeah. clean his arm. Right, yeah. right. Would you explain why they shouldn't write on their friends? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> if they listen to me long enough, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. That's true. Yeah. Right, right. I I work with um the moderate to severe, but they get it. You know, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, do you see me writing on my arm? <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, but they're um they're pretty you know with it. So mm -hmm. in our class, 
that doesn't mean we won't get some in the future that yeah. won't be writing on people's body parts, you know? Right, right. All right. They all never like themselves. Go ahead. Yeah. Don't ever put that in your mouth again. I have a student that eats everything off the floor. I don't, I don't ever say don't ever. I'll just say we only put food in our mouth. You know, snacks Excellent. is coming. Um, yep. Because he puts bugs, tissue, yeah. you name it. Yeah. And I just go, Ugh. I'm like, do you see me eating Kleenex? You know, I said, but basically just say we only eat food at school. Mm -hmm. You know, that's but, fabulous that you say because that's a learning experience for some yeah, students yeah, we only yeah. put food in our mouths yeah, right yeah. Like that's a learning experience so yeah. the fact that you say that to them is wonderful um, the other teaching piece that comes with that is when you say other people or people tend to think that that's kind of icky when we eat yeah. you know, bugs or tissues or whatever and they yeah. may not want to play with you yeah or yeah. hang yeah. with you if you're so again depending on who the student is and their needs uh mm -hmm. if they need that social thinking piece that yeah. they might be causing other people to think some uncomfortable thoughts yeah which then might uh, make them be like i don't want to play with you yeah um, the boy that, that i work part of it the boy that i work with is pretty mm -hmm. much nonverbal, but i'll say it he'll be like yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> like so okay. agreeable yeah. yeah that's awesome <laughs> All right, thank you. Group You're three, welcome. we have Amy, Bobby, Caroline, Joanne, and is it Sunny? Am I saying it correctly? Okay. And do we have our spokesperson for that group? Or someone who took the notes? All right, I go right to the middle here. We're gonna go for No, uh, I took Bobby. I took notes, so I'll, right, I'll Amy, do it. Go ahead. Everyone, Bobby, um, you were saved. <laughs> he'll have to do it next time. Yeah. Um, so first, I really like a lot of the responses that we've heard and, yeah. you know, can definitely use them. Uh, for pay attention, kind of, we all threw out ideas for that one. And then after that, we each took one. Okay, so, awesome. Great um, strategy. And then, so oh. mostly it was, I noticed you aren't focusing. It's important to hear the instructions or mm -hmm. things like that. Um, right, right. It's important to hear the instructions so that you can be successful. Right. Or so that, you know, whatever it happens to be, for that day it might be so you don't get in trouble. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but we want them to have a reason and start to be thinking in that reasoned way. Fabulous. Yeah. Uh, for stop fooling around, we said, uh, I'd really like to see you have a safe body. And for like my kids, we use a lot of visuals. So it would have been the, you know, eyes on me, things like that. But we would have been pointing it out because we have it on laminated cards because I work yeah. with younger children. So we want right. to be less yeah. intrusive right. to everything going on. Right. Um, for don't make rude comments to your classmate. I'd really like to hear kind words. How could we have said that nice. differently? Yes. Why did you write on Joey's arm? I notice a mark on Joey's arm. Uh, can you tell me how it got there and try to get them to explain why they, they did it. And then we could launch into why not to do it again, if they're still listening, because. Yeah. I not. think I might skip that part. Yeah. I think I might skip that whole, why did you do it thing? Mm. Or why is it there? And I might just go right to, um, other kids don't like it when we write on their arms. Mm -hmm. Basically, mm -hmm. I need you to not write on other people now. Mm -hmm. That's kind and of then like, tell them. Very objective. Right. Uh, for don't ever put that in your mouth again. I really like the only food goes into I your mouth. I, yeah. I really. Um, we kind of said, I noticed you're putting things in your mouth. And like I, I had mentioned that like I have a lot of oral sensory mm -hmm. children. So we right. kind of like, how about this instead and offer a different fidget that isn't yes. going to be something that goes in their mouth. Yes, right. And then that's a great, for those kids, it's a great teaching moment. Once again, the, the repetition mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you can put this in your mouth here. You can't put the dirty tissue in your mouth. You can put the rubber ducky in your mouth or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it happens to be. Just as a, an, <clears throat> um, an aside on this, 
this is important even in high school. Linda and I have both been in chemistry labs where we spend a lot of time discussing <laughs> why you can't put anything yeah. in your mouth in a chemistry lab. And yeah. this can also have an impact in middle school kids and even in an elementary school kids where they do do some experiments. So again, right. that's really an important question. Yeah, it is. Okay, thank you so much. And group four, Cheryl, Gina, and Tracy. <clears throat> I see. All right. Do we have, should I choose? Cheryl, Gina, and Tracy? All right. I am going to choose. <laughs> Uh, Jean is hiding. How did you know I was going to I was going to choose you? All right, well, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, that's the first time I've seen this. It's great. All right, how about Cheryl? <laughs> Cheryl Barker, can you please? Uh, well, where'd she go? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. I love it. Oh, yay! <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Oh, goodness. All right. Do you have um, any that are different from what other people said? No, not really. Okay. It's just about the same as what everybody else has been saying. So That's, why don't you just do, why don't you just do a couple of them then? Don't okay. do that if it's pretty um, much the same. No, wait, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I moved my paper, sorry. Um, the, uh, <laughs> especially... <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Gina, you're awesome. Um, <laughs> Yeah, put everybody on the spot. Thank you. No, um, I'm not the greatest at leading things, so I That's okay. I do better from behind. behind. I'm a loud mouth though sometimes. So like with this stop fooling around and um, like why did you write on Joey's arm? Basically, yeah. um, usually came back with, you know, it, it's that's not something you should be doing is writing on someone's arm. Um, why don't we write on people's arms, Cheryl? Because it's wow. unhealthy. <laughs> ah, thank you. Okay. So and, that would and, be part of what that. we'd say, right? Right. Yeah. It, it's unhealthy. And I have, though, after saying them, you know, you shouldn't be writing on other people's arms. It's not good. It's very unhealthy. Also, mm -hmm. and then I would turn around and say, well, would you like it if they actually wrote yeah. on your arm? And Right. Most of the time, they'd always say, no, I don't want somebody writing on me. Yeah. And yeah. then I'd say, well, think <clears throat> about that. If you don't like it, do you, mm -hmm. do you think right. they like it? Right. No. Which is awesome. And you're also helping them. Uh, a lot of our students don't have good perspective taking or theory of mind. So they may not even be thinking what someone else might be thinking. Right. So when you bring that up, it can help them to understand that, oh, other people are thinking thoughts that are different from my own. Because all right. I'm thinking is, wow, wouldn't it be cool to write on Johnny's arm? <laughs> yeah, and then all of a sudden, like, oh, yeah, no, 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 I don't want it on mine. So yeah, what makes right, you think so. it's okay to do it to someone else? Right, and they may not oh, be thinking oh, that at all, right? Again, right. When we talk about this idea of the expectations. People, they, they may not even understand those expectations. They're not thinking about, they're only thinking their own thoughts from their own perspective. Right. So the fact that you bring that up is kind of nice for them to start to... Um, and I realize, Don, like, Don, oh, other people, yeah. Yeah, Don also mentioned the idea of personal space, which is yes. a, really That's a whole, 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 yeah. like whole other <laughs> issue, yeah. Okay, um, last group. All right, our last group is Kathleen okay, Lydon, yeah. Kathy yeah, Kumar. The, they, they nominated me. All right, so, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, in the, um, paying attention to time, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. Absolutely. So one, we were doing the, um, you know, instead of stop fooling around, it's like eyes are looking, ears are listening type of thing we need. Whew. Yep. Where do you put your eyes? Where do you put your ears? Absolutely. Um, and then, um, you know, we use kind words in the classroom when well, they were talking about other people. Mm -hmm. um, and then do you tell them why? Do you tell them why we use kind words in the classroom? I, I would. Hmm. Why would we use kind words in the classroom? So that no one feels badly. Ah, 
fabulous, right? We use kind words in the classroom so that people, no one else feels bad. Yes. Yeah, fabulous. And then she, um, one of the people mentioned um, uh, with putting things in your mouth, you know, like pencils are for writing. Um, we have to keep things out of our mouths so we don't spread germs. Excellent. And then, one one of our one um, one person offers um, gum if somebody really needs to put something in their mouth mm -hmm. with a pocket, so she offers them a piece of gum so that they have right it. fabulous yeah these and so you're providing the options of what are the appropriate socially appropriate things to put in your mouth and that's what they need wow you guys are amazing like I am so impressed by this it's very cool um, I think we're gonna take a quick break <clears throat> because. We need to take a quick break. It's 1121. Are you guys okay with five minutes? Yeah? Okay. All right. Let's take like a five minute break and then we'll um, come back at it. This is going way faster than I ever expected it would. Ooh. All right. 1126. Why am I annotating this? That's so funny. All right, there we go. We're back at it. All right, so that was slide 13. <clears throat> no, yeah. it wasn't. That was slide 12. So I know we Okay, yeah. so now we have to start to move a little more quickly here. Yep. And we might have to skip one of the breakouts. Which one do you want to skip? Well, we're definitely going to skip the um, three, but I think um, I think we could do two as an open discussion. Just keep it to ten minutes. What do you okay. think? Uh -huh. That's fine with me. Okay, and then just call on. Give them a couple minutes to think, and then just call on people. Oh. The other thing is, do we <clears throat> want to? do we want this to go over and do we want to let people know that yeah, we are willing think, to keep going i think so okay so we'll do that when people come back yeah right? yeah okay all right that's what we'll do we still have um 23 we'll have, participants here which is pretty awesome yeah yeah so um i don't know do you want to do the breakout room and then a while <clears> that we're going to go over well let's talk to people first yeah. what do you think because if linda we're talking about um right. letting people like know that because we started late because of the glitches we can go until 12 15 see who wants mm -hmm. to stay uh, and then that will help us decide if we're going to do the breakout rooms okay the next breakout rooms so when people come back uh, what do you guys want to do i think we Breakout no, I mean, in terms of going over, are you comfortable going to 1215? Yeah. Yeah, I am too. So I think that we can tell people that we'll go until 1215 and they can stay or not and then right. see the rest of the recording afterwards. What do you think of that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I'm looking at, so next one, Linda, you're next, right? Yep. Okay. I just wanted you to know that, like, we can still hear everything oh, yeah, that you're yeah, talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I did. Okay. I was actually hoping, Amy, that you would, like, jump in <laughs> and give me your opinion. Yeah. <laughs> was it, wasn't sure. Yeah, was no, I, I can see you. I can, yep. Yeah. Okay. I can see you. I know you're right here. And um, just that this is the piece. They'll be editing this piece out anyway. But, um, yeah, like, what do you think of that? Do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Um... So I, I've been like scrolling through the um, the slides yep. and looking at like what's, you um, mm -hmm. know, a lot of it I already know just from, you know, yep. the, the, sure. the 12 years of yeah. doing yeah. behavior. Yes. Um, yeah. But your slide 21, like I, I since that's way at, at the bottom of the five point scale system, like that's something I don't know. So if you can try to touch on that before oh. the end i would love to yeah. hear okay yeah. hear that <clears throat> okay um, yeah i can be talking about those um yeah and i will 
And then again, it'll be recorded too. So if right. you have to bang out at noon and we're not there yet, then we'll, you know, it will absolutely be recorded. Yeah. We could also, I, we could probably put that in before emotional regulation and yeah. grounding strategies. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll move That'll it up. That'll be in our great. Thank you. Yeah, we'll yeah. move it up. All right. We're about ready to begin again. So, um, we we were talking with Allison, who mentioned to us that there was a glitch for a lot of people to join this presentation, this workshop. So we ended up starting 15 minutes late. So we plan to go an extra 15 minutes until 12:15. Um, we want to honor your time either way. So. If you want to stay through 1215, we will be here working through the presentation until 1215. If you need to leave at noon because it said 10 to noon, then that's fine too. And um, know that it will be recorded and you'll be able to look at the recording for the pieces that you miss. Um, is everybody okay with that? Because that will kind of inform how we move forward from here. So, okay. All right. Then I think, ladies, we should just continue with our plan and do do what we were going to do. And I will change that. We'll go to that one slide um, when we need to. All right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Linda, you are up. These yes, are so, other. Oh, go ahead. Um, some of the other language that we need to change is to make it short very simple, really direct. Tend to say something like, John, you've forgotten your backpack again. That's the third time today. Try and get that maybe to a statement of just saying, John, backpack. Um, yeah. Susie, homework agenda. Right. Just directing them to know what you want, that, what they need to be doing that they're not doing at that moment. Um, giving information. Um, so again, this goes back to things like paying attention or not fooling around, um, asking them to redirect their activity. Um, and again, you want to use a short statement, positive statement, and a, and a reason why. Um, if you boss people around, they won't want to work with you rather than just, you know, stop bossing people around. And describing the problem, this one really depends on the age. Um, I'm working with high school kids and I'm in inclusion classes. So for me, describing the problem is asking them really what, you know, like you don't have a pencil, what can you do to get that pencil? or what can you do to get that information that you missed? Do you need to go on your laptop? This is gonna be really different depending on the grades. Mm -hmm. um, but again, and with, with teens and middle schoolers too, um, giving them two specific suggestions can come off as condescending. Mm -hmm. So you wanna be careful with that. Uh, okay, so we have a another breakout activity. Mm -hmm. um, this this one's shorter. Um, activity two, it's practice time. So what we want you to do is to take these statements and change them to a positive statement. And we know that depending on what grade or population you're working with, they're going to be very different statements, and that's great. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm putting the this into the chat now, and then I'll put it in again um, afterwards <clears throat> when you're in your breakout room. So hopefully everyone will get this. So if you uh, can, no, sorry, wrong, that didn't work. Okay. Mm -hmm. Give me a sec. So if you can, 
try to oh, no. use the strategies of giving information or describing the problem or using short, simple language for these. So that's really what we're looking. We want it to be positive, but we want it to be short. A lot of our students, um, <clears throat> they don't process a lot of information. And if they're already at a place where they're feeling kind of emotional or stressed or anxious, they're really not processing most of the language that you're using. So it's very, very important that you use real short, very direct terms. Don't, they don't need a novel, they're not hearing it. They're really not processing that information. So nice, short and direct and give them the information that they need. Okay, so for this one, we'll do our whole group share and I'm just going to, unless you have chosen someone to speak, I'm going to have uh, the people from room one will just tell us what they did with the first comment. The people from breakout room two will tell us about the second comment, what they did, okay? Does that work for us? All right. All right, so in breakout room one, we have Donna, Teresa, and Emil. Who is going to speak for that group? Okay, so I'll talk this time. All right, thank you. Um, so for the first one, why isn't your homework written down? What, what will you do with that? So we had kind of a mix of things. I think we ended up with, um, we write our homework. Ah. So that it helps you later. Excellent. Um, yeah. Do you want to tell us any, any other one, any more from that one or was that like the biggie? Of, I think we added on, would you like to write your homework now or will ah. you write now? So kind of giving an instruction in addition yeah. to the reasoning. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you. Anyone have anything different from that, from the other groups? Uh, in our group, I'll just say quickly is, is that if they didn't write it, actually bring the paper over to them and say, here, we write our thing and, and work with yeah. them right at that point. Yeah, right, which is fabulous. You know, you do bring up a good point. We want to be in the moment whenever we possibly can. After the fact, they're like, what, what, I'm all done, what? So right in the moment, that's an excellent point. Yeah. All and right. Christina also said, right, uh, time to write your homework. Yeah, it's time to write your homework down, right? Short, sweet, beautiful, right? Or we write our homework down. Fabulous. Love it. All I'm right. also a big fan of kind of making gestures and catching eye contact. And if you have the homework posted or I've written it down on a sticky note, I can get their attention and just mm -hmm. point and, right. you know, say, write this, you know, right. or just even mouth the word, write this. Excellent. Because sometimes uh, words get in the way and visuals can be much more powerful. So yeah, that's awesome. All right, breakout room two. Do we have a speaker for breakout room two? Who can speak about number two? You never get to class on time? Uh, Allison, Carissa, Kathleen, Christina, Lupe, and that's it. Uh, yes, I do. Okay. I'm sorry, I thought we were group three. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so we had, uh, you're missing directions when you're late. Ah, that is fabulous. So short, sweet, and you tell them kind of one of the consequences for being late. Yeah, mm -hmm. love it. But we were also thinking, well, you know, the little ones, it's not their fault when they're late. They have no control when the parents bring them late. But no, even older right. students, you know, right. but still sometimes you still have to kind of address it with little ones to let them know. Right. Maybe we use that language with the parents. <laughs> yes, when you bring Johnny late, he misses all of the story time. <laughs> right, right. That's true. And that is true. Yeah, that is. It is true. I know. Thank you. I hate you. missing story time. Anyone have anything different for that one? You never go, you never get to class on time? So we talked about, um, how sometimes we actually don't start our class on time. Ah. And yet, that child who's coming in, we want them there on time. So um, I said, 
uh, we came up with class strikes at this time so that we can settle in and get started. Oh, I love it. Yes. Do, do you hear the difference in tone between both of the responses that you gave? Like, it is so just clear and respectful as opposed to you never get to class on time, right? Like, you're really giving kids the information they need when they do this. Like, yeah, this is awesome. All right. Uh, group three, Amy, Bobby, Caroline, Joanne, and Sunny. Who's going to speak so, for this one? Um, we said, can I help you tie your shoe? But then when you do that with the person, uh, get a, a model shoe and then work with them of, of a goal of, of yes. showing them how to tie the shoe and then getting them through the process of working right. on that. Right. Yeah. And that's it's huge. Again, you guys are bringing up such um, important issues here because I'll tell you, I've had kids in sixth grade, seventh grade, come up and put their foot in front of me and be like, hey, tie my shoe. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> like, the, in order for our students to be successful and independent, there are things that they need to learn how to do. So if you are offering assistance, then you absolutely, the next step is to say, let's show you how to do it now yourself, right? Because that's huge. You don't want to be the kid in the seventh grade who can't tie their shoes. So yeah, perfect. I love it. Anyone else have anything different from that one? Your shoes are always untied? There are a couple of good ones in the chat. Okay. Uh, shoes that are untied are unsafe. Excellent. Um, I don't want you to get hurt. Excellent. Right, so giving that connection between why we want our shoes tied. Once again, you are actually helping kids learn how to think about these types of problems and situations. Uh, and, it, and it may not seem like it, but the magic is actually happening the more you use this type of language. All right, group four, Cheryl, Gina, and Tracy. Who's going to go this time? It's not going to work twice, Gina. <laughs> okay, I'll speak. <laughs> okay, no yelling. <laughs> um, so we were saying um, inside voice. Okay, why? Um, it disrupts other people, other students. Yes, you're right. Don't yell, it disrupts other people, right? Mm -hmm. Or when we yell, it bothers other people. Bothers other, other people can't people. hear if we're yelling. Right. Right? Yeah. <laughs> this is another one. This is another one that I like to gesture where I might you know, hold my finger to my lips to indicate yeah. stop talking and then yes. just point at my ear for listening. Right. Yeah, which is lovely as long as you know that they understand that, like that sequence, like the piece, because you're teaching them those expectations, right? Like so, the, the, and the causation, yelling causes other people to not be able to hear. Right. Yeah, fabulous. All right, and breakout, thank you, Gina. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and breakout room five. Okay, so we put, um, I mean, real quick, like walking feet or we walk in the hallways. It's safer to walk in the hallways. Ah, there we go. Right? We walk in the hallways. It's safer when we walk. Perfect. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty much what we want. And again, I, I think this is funny, but I feel like I'm saying this even in the high school. I'm saying this to seniors <laughs> in high school. Right? Like, yes. we want you to be safe. Slow down. <laughs> Actually, I tend to say I don't want to fill out an accident report. Yeah. All right. Anyone else for this one for uh, don't run in the hallways? Okay. Fabulous. You guys are really amazing the way that you are able to take these types of situations and turn them into something that's so much more positive. Like, yeah, pretty cool. Cool stuff here, man. All right. Okay, another strategy that is really awesome and helpful in the classroom are giving kids notes, right? Just give them a note because, you know, I think, I don't know if you've noticed this theme yet, but too much language isn't good for a lot of kids if they're feeling emotionally dysregulated, if they're anxious, if they don't know what the heck is going on, 
a lot of times they are missing most of the language that we're using. So notes are lovely because it gives them time to process. Uh, it doesn't call attention to a specific behavior out loud. Have you ever been in a classroom where the teacher does that or another assistant does that to a kid? They call them out, right? Yep. That can be very embarrassing for a student. So uh, these are, can be preemptive or after the fact. And sometimes you're helping a kid as soon as they step into the classroom so that they, you know, don't have those behaviors. But other times you might need to make them feel better, right? Or just give them a reminder later on. So really important if we're talking about preemptive uh, for some of my students i have a lot of blurters i just give them a little note that says remember three questions today like that's it on my little note right so or a note that just to remind one of my students um, teachers don't like to be corrected in front of the whole class so just a little note you just kind of put it on the desk and go off on your merry way and uh, and they're fine with that. So <clears throat> we can talk to them after the fact, right? Like, oh, I was concerned that you didn't write your homework down today. You know, what can you do differently tomorrow? Just again, do you see what's happening? You're letting them think. And even if they're not ready to write it down tomorrow, they're starting to think about that. Oh, I actually have the option to think about something and, and maybe the agency to do it tomorrow. So just like, I was concerned, gee, where were you? Uh, funny ones, right? Like, John, I'm going crazy. I can't find anything. Signed, your binder, right? Like, just a lot of kids really like the funny ones. So that can help. Um, you know, to what Bobby was talking about earlier, offers of assistance. If you want my help, just use the signal. And Tracy was talking about her, I, you know, her use of signals, also really important. But, um, you know, if you want my help, use our signal. So, and then it's, it's really kind of unobtrusive because sometimes I think, and, and you all can speak to this as well when you're in the classroom, sometimes it feels like we're dividing kids' attention, right? They're trying to listen to the teacher. We're trying to do something with them. It can divide their attention. So giving them notes, sometimes even just a little smiley face after, you know, they've had a particularly terrible interaction. <laughs> sometimes that's very helpful too. Um, so, what are, what do you think of some situations that you would be in that would let you offer a note to a student? When would be a time you might be able to give them a note instead of using words? I hear somebody saying something. I think that if I were to catch them doing something well, yeah. um, to just write nice job or yeah. Um, even if I catch them, you know, doing something kind for another student or yeah. sitting down and doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing, just a thank mm -hmm. you, or like you said, a smiley face. Yes. Yeah. That's a beautiful time to use a note because again, a lot of our students don't feel successful and they feel like they're often, you know, the, the people are just looking at their weaknesses. So the, they will appreciate when you don't call them out on something. <laughs> So when else could you give them a note? What do you guys think? In the preschool classroom that I work in, mm -hmm. um, we do data sheets for all the kids. So if we catch them doing like a random act of kindness or they yeah. do an exceptionally good job at a workstation, we'll write yeah. it on the data sheet and yeah. then the teacher will share it with their parents at the end of the day in their, in their books. Yeah, that's awesome. So for those guys at that level, you could just give them a little note or a sticker, right? Like a smiley right. face sticker that goes on their desk just so that they know that, gee, I did something right or I did something well. You know, that um, is very helpful. <clears throat> a lot of our kids actually have token boards. And yeah. it's the behaviors we're looking for. But yes. rather especially in inclusion, we don't want to call them out, but we'll go and put a token on it. So they know yeah. I'm doing what I should be doing. And I mean, you see the smiles and right. yeah. them coming out with, I, I earned whatever it is that they happen to pick out. Right. Which, right. Um, and you yeah. don't have to say anything. You can just very quietly go put the token on. They mm -hmm. know, it, I know what it is, but nobody else is really aware of it. Right, right. And it just, uh, you know, you think about these kids and how happy they can, you can make them feel just because you noticed, right? 
also an excellent preemptive strategy. Yeah. Believe it or not, it also works at the high school level. Oh, We've yeah. done that in different yeah, classes. It does. Uh huh. It does. So then we have um. We have this idea of praise, right? And we've been talking a lot about that now. And I just want to, again, this comes from Tom McIntyre, but to, to think about how we praise kids. Because there's a lot of information out there now that tells us that if we praise kids and tell them that they're perfect, they're the best, right? You're the only one who can do this. Um, we're sending a message that the grades and scores matter more. And then for a lot of our kids, when we say that and we tell them like, you're the best and you're awesome, um, then they start to feel like they have to attain this perfection all the time at all costs. So this causes a lot of kids, especially getting to the older grades to start to cheat and to lie because they feel like they now must be perfect. So uh, a lot of kids end up with performance anxiety and they're worried that they're gonna fail because if they're constantly hearing that they're perfect and they're wonderful, well, what happens if they're not? So we don't really wanna do that. Um, backhanded praise, you know, I wish I could say that I've never heard any of this, but I hear this, you know, like, you, this hurts kids. It's pointing out their failures, right? And it takes whatever positive you gave, gave the kid and it negates it um, and, and it makes it meaningless. So what a kid is going to really hear is the, is the put down, right? Not like, wow, you, you know, you, you got a really good grade today, but instead, I didn't even think you had it in you. You know, like that just kind of negates everything. So again, I don't know in your experience if you've seen people do this, but man, it breaks my heart when I see it. And that's usually the point where I step up. You know, there's certain points you're like, you choose your battles. This is one of the times I choose my battles. And I will typically, I will talk to a teacher and be like, you know what? Like, I just noticed this and cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. Here's what happened. So, um, yeah, that one like really, really gets to me. I don't know if anybody's ever used the expression that for a really good paper or test or something that's been done well, um, but I always like that belongs on the refrigerator. You know, mm. it's non judgmental, it's not. You know, it's saying you did a really good job and your parents should see this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's a nice one. So controlling praise, this one, I will tell you that I had to work against for a long time <laughs> because I'm always in my quest to like help kids be better and whatever. I'd be like, yeah, you know, oh, you should do this all the time. You know, you did a great job on that. You know, you did your homework. You did all of it. You should do it all the time. Well, a lot of the research shows us that when this controlling kind of praise really deflates students, so they, it demotivates them because they're like, oh, I did it once and now you expect it all the time from me. A lot of kids don't have it in them to be able to do it every single time. And when I'm learning something new or doing something challenging, I might get it right the first time, but have you noticed all of the glitches we've had so far in the Zoom meeting, right? Like, it is not gonna be per perfect, not for a while. So, you know, saying to me, well, you brought everyone back from the breakout room and you could see them again, so you should just do that every time, right? Like, ah, uh, no, <laughs> I'm not there yet, can't do it. <laughs> so uh, there's a burden, right? There's a burden and a responsibility that comes with that type of controlling praise when you expect that type of perfection. Um, and then the, un, the unearned, right? Like, you know, great job. You're so wonderful. You, you are awesome when they didn't do anything. Kids, even little kids also understand and feel the insincerity of that. So use partial praise, find something, you know, like pretty awesome. This was a, a tough day for you. You picked up your pencil. Okay, if that's our win for the day, that's the win. But I would rather be honest with a kid than praise them for, for poor work because then a couple of things happen. They, you know, you're sending a message that, that you don't have to meet the standard. And I believe our kids can meet the standard. So 
don't do, we don't want to do that. Same thing with labels, right? Right, labels. Um, kids know their strengths and weaknesses. They know when a label is accurate and um, studies have shown that when we put a label, it actually can send a kid to create a performance of the, the exact opposite. So if we tell them they're a superstar, um, they're not going to believe you if they're not, right? If they're not a superstar, that they know, we all know. So um, they may even start to act in the opposite way. Um, they're not going to believe you and then you'll come across as kind of insincere. So, um, you know, be descriptive, right? You made a great prediction today. That was awesome. You had to be really listening closely today in order to be able to write down those details. Fabulous. I like the way you, you know, this work is, your writing is. So be very descriptive and detailed in what you tell them. Um, then you're verbalizing and you're also teaching them the desired behaviors, just like everything else we've talked about today. We want them to understand what we want from them. <clears throat> Praise effort. Um, are all of you familiar with Carol Dweck and her growth mindsets? Um, she's done a lot of work in this area. Um, we don't, we want to make sure that we talk to the kids about the effort that they're putting in. And sometimes it might only be a little bit. Again, that might be what they have for the day. So progress, like this is an interesting one that the idea of praising progress, a lot of my students, they aren't able to break things into pieces and they don't know that they've made progress. So I've actually started pointing out, like I point out now to kids what strategies they're using and what progress they've made. They, they might not know, which is kind of interesting. They'll be like, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm so used to like, everything I do is terrible, that they may not see that writing two statements, writing a word, drawing a picture is progress. So this can help them start to see like, oh, we can break it into pieces too. So uh, I think that's a really important one. It seems kind of simple, but it's pretty important. Okay, Linda Lawrence. Okay, so um, we're going to uh, change discussion. this up a little bit. Instead of a breakout room, what we want you to do is to um, put in your grade level and list three th strategies that you use to manage behavior, and you're going to put that into the chat. Um, we're going to then gather up all those chats and put them in a document and send them all out to you so we can all have those together. Um, use your expertise. It's like, mm -hmm. you are the experts, but you also have other experts that you can refer to. Um, I always go to Helen when I need strategies for um, anything to do with speech or language, behavior, Helen and Steph are my go-to people. Um, you know, think about who you work with in the building that can help you um, and what advice they might give you. And so we're gonna take five minutes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Five minutes on this and then just put the three strategies and your grade level in the chat and we will send all that out to you. Yep. Yeah. That way you'll have a list compiled by you of and things that you, work. No pressure to put down three things. You can also just put down your favorite, your favorite thing that you like yep. to manage behavior. Yep, reinforce positive behaviors, Donna. Absolutely. Reminders and praise of the right kind. Yes, absolutely. Praise, redirect, reminders. I'm starting to see a, a pattern here. Modest severe. Modest severe. First then board. Yes. For who's yeah, first thens, Christina. Absolutely. <clears throat> are really helpful. Those are helpful not just for kids with moderate to severe disabilities. The first then helps kids, helps all kids understand uh, the cause and effect and that that what they want is coming, helps them yeah. with delayed gratification. It's fabulous. Yes, absolutely. 
I use that with my own kids at home. <laughs> do you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, first we have to do this, then we can go yeah. outside or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, for some kids too, there's another way we you can phrase it as a when then. So okay. when you do this, then we will do that. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Which is kind of nice for, um, uh, it's a nice change up for some kids and it lets them know that it's tied to what they want is tied to that behavior. When you okay. do this, then this will happen. So that's yeah. another, another way to go. Awesome. Uh, for, I love that. Yeah. Praise, reminders, high fives. Ah, no more high fives. What are we going to do with the COVID? High elbows? Like, what's it going to be? I don't even know if we're going to do any of those. It's going to be air fives, right? Like, yeah. woo! <laughs> <sighs> visuals. Yes. Absolutely visuals. Three to five token charts, rewards. Pick your battles. Yes, Therese, pick your battles. <laughs> Absolutely. Preschool, short sentences, give information a lot. Love that, Kathleen. Johnny, backpack. I noticed that you did. Yep. Preschool is really, uh, that's helpful for them. Just don't use a lot of language. If I could take most language out, I would. Ah, come talk to me for a minute. That whole personal relationship piece. Yes, Kristen. Tell me what's wrong and how I can help. Giving kids that sense that they can accept support and that they can move beyond where they're at. Sticker charts, item choices, yes. Yeah, using the notes, short and direct. Inclusion and first thins, yep, from Amy. Falcon phone calls, that's interesting. Oh, I love it completely, this is awesome. So for uh, K to two, home kids can get phone calls home from the principal to talk about positive behavior. Great okay. idea. Yes, great, I love it. I would like to try it at the high school. I bet that'd be kind of cool. I did, I reached out to a parent recently because of something that their student did and I was so impressed with it. And the, it, I guess it's a little sad, but the parent emailed back and said, wow, we, it, it's so nice to hear that. We've never heard anything like this before. Uh, it's just so, so I love that one. Humor and jokes, absolutely. Yes, Carissa, absolutely humor and jokes and one-on-one -on -one conversations. Like we, those middle and high school kids, man, we can start to talk to them one-to-one. -one. Praise board, when writing a note for positive reinforcement, put one on a board in the support room. Oh, that's nice. Token boards, visual checklists, one-to-one -one conversations, yep, absolutely. All right, I think in the interest of time, we're gonna move forward. If you haven't put your stuff in the chat, can you please? All right. So when we talk about emotional regulation with our students, do you wanna do this one, Steph? You want me to do it, you compiling? Can't hear you, man. Oh, sorry. Um. We were going to skip to the five point scale system for okay. all right because there was a yeah. request for that. Okay, so I'll go to that. But just keep in mind that your students won't be regulated if you are not regulated. That piece is huge. All right, and they'll feel it coming off of you. Mm -hmm. So you yep. need to be a little Miss Mona Lisa there. All right. I'm going to move through that. So the five point scales, I really like five point scales because they're such a really um, wonderful way for kids to see visually and verbally where they're at. It helps them develop awareness. It helps them start to think through things. So, and they're so quick and easy. I've listed a bunch of them up there. If you're going to do, if you're going to look at any of them, look at the incredible five point scale. And um, for my older students, I use all the time a five is against the law. Because as kids get older, some of the behaviors that they do when they're young can become um, against the law when they're old. So, and they need to start to understand this, but they're beautifully visually represented. Um, I put down the website for um, the, the um, Carrie Dunn's Five is Against the Law and the Incredible Five Point Scale. 
the, it's, they're really nice. But if you don't use those, you basically draw a scale for someone and say, where are you at? Right? And it's one to five. So where are you at? How worried are you? One is I'm freaked out of my head. Five is, um, you know, I'm fine. And then they can just say where they're at. It helps kids, it takes the shift away from where they are and they can look at something and focus on something to help bring them back into their logical brain. So um, you can get kids used to them, you show them how they work, it lets them know that you're listening to them and that you're concerned about them. Um, you know, you can do homework completion. Where are you at with your homework completion? One is none of it, five is all of it. It takes the onus off the kid. And again, we, we're not doing all that blaming. Uh, when I use these scales with kids, I say, none of this is a judgment. It's all about where you at and then what do you want to do about that? So use them, draw them, get the kids to start to think about them. And there is the anxiety curve is also listed the website for this. And I really like this because it not only shows what a student might be thinking or feeling physically, it also gives suggestions as someone is becoming more and more anxious and then less and less anxious, what you should and shouldn't do. So if you have a chance to look at this one, I would highly recommend looking at this one. It's, um, it, it's very, very helpful because a lot of our students don't understand when they're ramping up and then when they're at that top, our inclination when someone's at the top of that anxiety scale or dysregulated to start talking to them and do stuff like try to help them and that's the time we have to step back because they're not hearing anything and um there were some comments about the similarities to zones of regulation which oh is, yeah, yeah yeah it's all they're all like the same because we want our students to understand what they're feeling uh, mm -hmm. emotionally and physically so that they can start to work with that as they get older um, okay, right. well, we have a number of slides on collaboration, um, and it's a little bit late for the collaboration piece. One thing um, that I think is important is that remember that you're there for the students. You're not there to be um, a teacher's personal servant, and right. that again teachers are human and it's a good thing to talk to them before you when you first at the beginning of the year when you first start working with them um that you should know what they expect of you and what you expect of them so if you could just have a very frank conversation with the teacher that you're working with um sometimes if you do it at the beginning of the year it avoids problems later down the road um, and the other thing is that you should know what's in your contract. Um, different school systems have different, um, different duties written in for their instructional assistants and paraprofessionals. And it really is in your own best interest to know that. Um, so that, you know, if a, if a teacher asks you to do something and it's specifically in the contract that you shouldn't do it, you can point that out respectfully and just say, I am not here to, you know, wash the, wash the chalkboards at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, again, if you're a one-to-one -one and a teacher asks you to help other students and there's no one else in the room, yes, you're a one-to-one, -one, but you are also there for other students in a sense. Um, but again, this is something that needs to be work out with the teacher you work with in advance. Um, and it does avoid um, negative feelings later on. Um, Linda, is there anything else you wanna add to that piece? Um, you have to remember that the teacher's not your supervisor. Your supervisor is your special ed person. Um, so if, if there's a disagreement about what your duties are, then that's the person that you want to meet with. Um, mm -hmm. Any glitches, that's the person that you want to meet with and go over those glitches um, because that's the person that is 
is your boss is giving you your review is giving you your direction um, if teachers ask you to do things like uh, simplify an exam we're not supposed to do that mm -hmm. okay that's a modification we don't do that your teacher needs to understand that um, Yeah. They also need to know that you're not a body in the room. You're there, you're helping students. You're not their person at their personal disposal. Okay. So that conversation at the beginning of the year to establish, you know, what you feel like your role is and, and how they see that and working out those differences before kids start coming in is the best option. Sometimes, usually it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Yep, it's, uh, it's, um, it's really important that you understand that you are uh, an integral part of the team. It, it can get fuzzy because the teacher often is supposed to be directing what you do, but they're not the boss of you right like linda was saying so you have to it's a fine kind of fuzzy line that you can be walking but i i know that um some of you have been working on a description for years it can be pretty powerful if if you do have a description an actual job description and if you look on your district's employment website you might find it there particularly if they're hiring because they often will put something in there and that would be a place for you to start from to see what the expectations are but the upfront direct communication with the teacher i think is so important not easy for all of us to go in and say here's what i expect i'll do but when you go in from a collaborative approach and you say this is what i think my job is supposed to be what do you think that way you can start to make sure that you're on the right page because if you know if your expectation is that you'll work with your one-on-one -on -one student but if other kids need help you're certainly going to help them but the teacher's like no you work with your student um you know it's good to get that up out and up um get that out up front so that you can say well you know i'd like to be able to do this um you know, same thing, if you want to, if someone asks you to make copies, if it's something that you're comfortable with, even if your contract says you don't have to do that, then, you know, okay, you can say, I don't mind helping you out in this way. I don't want to do it all the time. So making sure that you have that conversation ahead of time is really, really important. And there, there are some teachers who really struggle to figure, mm -hmm. they struggle to figure out what to ask you to do. Right. So again, sometimes if you have strengths that the teacher doesn't know about and you want to do things, talk to them about doing it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, and yeah, that may also be, be helpful. Right. Um, and you all have, you all have, unless you're going to a new place, you all have a reputation in the building. You know, um, I do math and science. When I work with a new teacher that I haven't worked with before, because I've been there so long, they they know a little bit about me and how I work. Um, and that's going to carry forward for you also. Teachers are going to know that you're doing a great job and that mm -hmm. um, they're going to be happy to have you. Mm -hmm. But again, if you're going into a new teacher, they would also appreciate knowing kind of your thought process and yep. what your expectations are because they may not know either. Or you might be preemptively stopping them from thinking that you're the one who goes and gets their coffee every day. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> so yeah, have the conversation that I think if we had to like really boil all of the collaboration piece down, it's have the conversation. And like Linda said, if you need to um, go to your special ed teacher or your special ed director 
and and go from there if it's necessary if any conversations with the teacher just don't work all right. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and for participating in the breakout rooms and for, for everything that you've done. Right, right. And we hope that you see that, um, that you feel validated in the job that you do. It's really important. Thank you. I got great Thanks, ideas everybody. from you guys. <laughs> Take care. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>